Hi, I'm Nafisa and I'm the Features Editor of Tatler Singapore. With us, we have my colleague and my Editor-in-Chief, Ahn Ko. And we also have three of the most successful tech guys in Singapore who also happens to be our November cover stars. So we have Lai chang Wen, who is the CEO and co-founder of NinjaVan. And NinjaVan is Southeast Asia's fastest growing logistics solution company. We also have Dinesh Balasingam, the Chief Business Officer and founding team member of Chop, a real-time restaurant reservation booking platform. And we also have Darius Matani Cheng, Group CEO and co-founder of 99 Group, a leading real estate tech company that operates 99 Co, the largest property portal in Singapore and Indonesia. To walk everyone through this session today, we're going to do it in two parts. The first one will be about your entrepreneurial struggles, your paths, and why you decided to start your businesses in the first place. And the second take will be about the tech industry as a whole and how like recent tech movements have impacted your companies. Maybe we can start with an introduction about each of you. Perhaps, Dinesh, you can tell us what made you want to join Chope in the first place? Because I understand that you were pretty young. You were 22 or 23? Was, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, I didn't think too much about it back then. Mm -hmm. uh, in school, I sort of, towards the end, struggled a little bit with the typical sort of learning styles. Yeah. And before going to university, I thought I wanted to get hands-on with something. The opportunity presented itself. And I was really working with a lot of great individuals, a lot of whom were older than me, mm -hmm. a lot of whom had gone to college, had gone to like Stanford and Harvard and all these amazing schools. And I thought, what better way than to learn from them. Yep. Uh, and so it was an easy decision at that time. I don't think I thought too much about it, like yeah. I said, and just never looked back from there. Mm. Yeah. So a fun fact is that um, Dinesh actually, he kind of gave up his position in uni and he never actually went. And for him to go this far, I think it's really a success story. Oh, what is them brave? So yeah. <laughs> See, they say brave. <laughs> the truth is, I was just telling her this. I didn't even think about it back then because you're like, you're 22. Yeah. And I had the opportunity. Look, like mm. it is a privilege to be able to say mm. that I can afford to fail on this entrepreneurship journey because I had my parents who I know I could rely on at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I was providing for a family or had all these big responsibilities so I could afford to take that risk. But again, back then, it just didn't seem like a risk. It was like, this feels right, so just yeah. gonna go for it. Now, if you ask me to do it like 13 years later, looking back at it, uh, I think, yeah, I would do it all again. So you would advise your younger self to do the same thing again? 100%. Would you let your kids drop out? I, sh I would, yeah. yeah. I would, yeah. That's a real testament. Yeah. My co-founder did the same. Every year, he's looking at MBAs. It's like, I feel a bit <laughs> in, that, in that. I feel like I kind of need to get there. I, I need something. But I think at that point also, it's just like at some point, you think about it and there were definitely moments where you meet people who mm. are so qualified and so like, you know, well-studied yeah. or, or learned and you're just like, am I missing out on something? There's a little bit on that like chip on FOMO, your shoulder, yeah. a little bit of a FOMO, yeah. a little bit feeling of like, you know, inadequacy a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then I think I just call it, sort of wrote that wave all the way. It's an interesting years. question because, you know, in Singapore, we put so much uh, weight on education. Mm. Yeah. But for you guys who actually obviously did, did do uni, did you find yourself using those skills or what you learned in school in the entrepreneurship, you know, in this journey to start companies? Or was it something that you learned elsewhere? I think Darius, you started your, you started 10 Cube while you were still in the US, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I started my first company mm -hmm. uh, while I was still in school. Mm -hmm. And then we sold that company and then I started 99 um, some seven years later. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 to answer your question, I don't think it's as much about using the specific things we learned in school as it is, it's like going to gym. It's mm -hmm. like training for your mind. Mm -hmm. So you lifting weights is not that you were actually ever carrying stuff for a living, um, but it trains your muscles, it trains your brain, and then I, I do think that that's useful. <laughs> this is something I don't tell people, but sometimes I think of, think back on my engineering degree and control systems and how that applies to people and mm. incentive systems and you know uh, employee incentives and so on. So I, I do think it is useful. Not necessary, but useful. <laughs> How about like the networking part of that? Did that ever come into play? Like people you met in school who were also successful, like startup founders or started companies, being able to network with them to sort of grow business? On that note, I started my first company with my roommate. Mm. So that's sort yeah. of the biggest thing that come out of mm. it. And I started 99 with my other roommate that I did not start the first company with. <laughs> yeah. But for me, Ninja was started with my primary and secondary schoolmates. 
Oh, so, wow. I mean, wow. if you ask, is university required? Uh, I would say it depends. There are many more chances to network out there. Yeah. Primary so, and know, secondary schools close enough. <laughs> in France, you know, for a long time, you really trust them. I think it's all yeah. about trust as yeah. co-founders. Mm. More than someone you just met. You, know, you, can, you can share a passion for the first year, you lose it very quickly. Yeah. So you know someone well for 10 years, you, you know he's going to stay that way forever. Yeah. So a yeah. bit different. But if you ask me, I, I, on my last year, I didn't go to school. I started in the bank. Yeah. So I was, in a, I was a trader. And I left to do Marcella, a fashion company, mm. and then Ninja. If you ask me to play it all over again, I think I might have taken my time. Mm. Oh. I might have maybe worked for five, seven, eight years first. But why though? I think there are a lot of mistakes I've made along the way, small mistakes, mm -hmm. which perhaps could be prevented. I'm not sure about you guys, but you know, in building a business, there were many questions I asked. Mm. To what level should you push HR? How much performance management you need? Many of these non-binary answers, mm. not black, not white, many shades of grey. Mm. But you never really had that life experience to decide which shade of grey. And you go online and you read a lot of things. Mm. They keep giving you black and white. They never tell you the shit, 50 shades of grey which is important in life. <laughs> it's always black and white and I think that is not right. Yeah. Well, I think it was useful to then have investors who had portfolio companies who were like good investors and willing to introduce you to people who are maybe further along on that journey. Yeah. Uh, and like for me, like my founder or CEO, Arif, like he had great connections from when he went to Stanford Business School and these guys were maybe further along on their journey and so were able to then like advise us on that. Yeah. Uh, and that helped for, for us especially. Plus uni was a blast. You need to yeah. get the party yeah. out of you. Yeah. <laughs> that is because once you start, it heads down, right? You yeah. can't you can't leave it. So that's true, right? That's the one yeah. little phone I had. Right? Maybe don't rub it in this <laughs> Yeah, like all my best friends <laughs> who are like in the UK, in the US, in in, in Singapore, yeah. and you would like it's the age of social media. So you see everybody like kind of living it up and partying. Mm -hmm. I had a great time. I, like I said, I wouldn't change anything for the world. But there was a little bit of like a once you <laughs> once you're kicking, want to eat it too in that sense. <laughs> I want to jump on this idea of making mistakes. In, in the early phase of your of your career, <clears throat> so I mean, what were some of for you the biggest mistakes that you felt you made, um, and how have you corrected those in 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 the journey so far? I think it's easy to jump jump into a startup, having a very startup founder mindset, you know, rah rah, rah. and then you start to drive a very obvious divide between who founded the company and who are the professionals, mm. and it takes a lot of effort to unwind that divide. It takes a lot of effort to professionalize it or making people feel that professionals also have a vested interest in a company. Yeah. And that transition is by no means easy. And I think if you started off with a group of founders, maybe or a group of early employees, and you drove home that culture too hard, it becomes something which is almost irreparable. It's very difficult to unwind that mistake. And I think we caught that early enough, but it still cost us a lot of problems. And that mindset never fully goes away. So I think it really depends what you're starting a business for. You know, mm -hmm. Is it a family business? Is it something which you want to professionalize? Mm -hmm. And understanding that gives you a very different starting point which allows it to transition mm -hmm. in a more organic manner after that. Mm -hmm. So you, to this day, you still have to actively and consciously kind of step back away from that mindset? 100%. Yeah. The, the mindset of founders versus mm -hmm. professionals. Professionals feeling that founders are overly entitled. Mm -hmm. Founders believing that professionals do not care. Yeah. I think these are all wrong mindsets. Mm -hmm. But it all stems from this initial founder startup hype vibe kind of mentality. Yeah. I mean, I wish I started a company like WhatsApp. Like, 10 people worth 10 billion? Fantastic. <laughs> but if it's not going to be the case, you have a real organization and yeah. how does the organization look? I think that's important. Mm. I think similarly on the people side of things, when it comes to scaling your business, mm -hmm. you know, going from 1 to 10 employees and 10 to 100 is very yeah. different. And I think that the idea then of what works for your company and sort of your culture that you've built, and like you said, sometimes bringing professionals from the outside can be game-changing in a very positive way. Sometimes like pulling someone who's used to running a company that has a thousand employees and bringing them into a company that has 50, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of clashes there for better or for worse. And so I think like knowing when you're ready to really try to professionalize the organization and not trying to kind of get ahead of yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the people and the culture fit, I think it was something that over time we've learned what are the right type of people for us yep. um, and what kind of people like maybe they are in extremely intelligent, extremely capable, but just maybe not the right fit for where the company was at that time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think for me in a similar vein, but slightly different would be I think we started with some imposter syndrome and that leads to many things. Um, that leads to, and plus some naivety. naivety. Mm. So what that leads to is that us taking a lot of bad advice. 
well intended, but bad advice. Mm -hmm. um, what I've learned over, I think now I've done startup for about 20 years now. Yeah. What I've learned is that every startup has its own journey, its own circumstance. And first principle thinking in terms of just recognizing, that, hey, you probably know your business better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And making your own course is probably the best course of action rather than kind of listening to somebody with a Stanford MBA and yeah. have taken a, a leaf out of book, a book somewhere else. Um, again, well intended, but not necessary. Mm. Applicable. I cannot agree more with you on that. <laughs> you, know, you, you meet too many people out there who have started a business with like 10 people. They come up, they talk a lot of shit, say this is the way you should do things. Just like, you can share what you did and why you did what you did. But yeah. don't say that that's the right way to do it because yeah. every business is different. Yeah. And I think the problem I see is that there are too many people out there who are too inexperienced or who talk too much and tell people that there's only one way to do something. Yeah. And I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. Like my younger self would have listened to a lot of this advice. Oh, my, my guys have did listen to a lot of this <laughs> advice and wasted a lot of, wasted lots of time. Mm. Yeah. Okay, talking about that, right? You guys have run your businesses for what, 10, 20 years between the three of you? Looking back, what are some missed opportunities that you can, you know, that you reflect on that might have possibly accelerated your growth, but you missed out on? To be honest, you never really know, right? Yeah. Like, I, when I look back at some things and say, would we have taken path A or B? Mm -hmm. We took B. And even at that time when we took path B, we expected a certain outcome, which didn't happen. Yep. So I think it's very difficult to sort of go back or, or spend too much time on that for me personally, mm -hmm. just because I always feel like the outcome that is intended or is the reason why you started mm -hmm. down this particular path in the first place, it mm -hmm. may not be what ends up being <laughs> the case. So I think for me, like when I look at missed opportunities, there, there really isn't much. Yeah. I think if anything, it's always around you know, people mm -hmm. uh, around finding the, the right fit for people uh, and, and, and maybe seeing what we could do better yep. on that front, uh, but never about like opportunities to grow the business specifically. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I do have regrets though. <laughs> <laughs> I love the honesty. Spill it. <laughs> well, I mean, you think about it. We were faced with e-commerce, booming market, mm. and super high growth. Mm. And I think the decision made then and then is let's focus firmly on that. And I must say that decision has its pros and cons. Mm. So during that segment, a lot of investors, a lot of people in the market were saying, why don't you look at the gig economy? Why don't you hire drivers for one parcel at a time? Mm. So on and so forth. And I think we were very resistant against that. At that point in time, our thinking was it's more important to focus on how you build a scalable, sustainable workforce than one which is a sharing economy and keeps moving around. Mm. Didn't believe much in that. In retrospect, I think that was the right decision. If not, the entire company would be an extremely unstable and we might never get the quality or the skill we have. However, that focus on e-commerce led us to focus only on e-commerce. And that, I think, is a mistake because the business we built, we have about 70,000 drivers out there. Why did we allow all 70,000 drivers to focus on delivering e-commerce? There are so many other things to deliver. Mm. Delivering bags, delivering items to retail, we deliver all of the Faber Castell pens all over Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We deliver PNG goods all over the Philippines. We deliver pastries, frozen pastries all over Greater Jakarta. There were so many more things we could have done. Mm -hmm. But it took us too long because we were too enamored by e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's one of my potential biggest regrets out there. But do you think if you went like wider and did all those different things, it would be maybe harmful if not in terms of focus? I think the idea at times that one can only do one thing at one time well mm. and focus is a huge fallacy. Mm. If you are required to do your core business well mm. and at the same time spend a sufficient amount of effort diversifying out of it, I think that's imperative that you have to do that. Mm. And to say that you have to choose one or the other is, I think it's a very dangerous way of thinking. As opposed to not going down the sharing economy. Mm. That wasn't about balancing, right? That was about yeah. not following a fad. Right. Mm. It's one thing to not follow a fad. It's another thing to say that I can only focus on one thing at one time and yeah. do that. I think mm. that's dangerous perhaps. Yeah. And you mm. recently started the cold chain. It started about a year ago. Right. And if you ask me that, it's five years too late. Yeah. My, my experience is kind of the opposite, which I think comes down to the lesson learned is how do you define your core? Mm. What is the core? So for us, we probably tried too many different things and got distracted. And I think every time in our history, we have done, look at something that, okay, this works. Can we do more of it? that has always had a good outcome. Mm -hmm. And when we say that that looks interesting, let's explore because it's adjacent to what we do. Mm -hmm. um, things that are 
related to property, but not necessarily cost strength, like mortgages and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and that never worked out all that quite well. Um, so I think it, it really comes back down to for us, my lesson learned is, you know, defining the core. Our core is really how do we build the marketplace that consumers want to look for properties. Mm. And what does that entail? Everything is everything that entails is core. Everything that does not entail is not core. Mm. Um, probably that's my biggest lesson learned mm. yeah, or regret. So like together, yeah. it's a plethora yeah. of lessons which are a bit different, but <laughs> yes. no single yeah. one is correct. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's the true. same point, right? Yeah. 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 You know, maybe you could also let us know how your companies have evolved over the past 10 years. Maybe we could start with you, Darius. Oh, how we massive evolved. growth, right, for you guys? Yeah, we have. E yeah. We definitely have evolved a lot over yeah. 10 years, right? Um, so for one, for example, now Indonesia is a tremendous growth market for mm -hmm. us. Um, we're glad that, we, it took, and it took us many years. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of touch and go moments, right? Would this ever work? Is this ever going to be a market that's real? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's only until last year we 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 looked at it and said that yes, this is a real market and it will continue to thrive for many years to come. Um, so that is, for example, a big shift. But we went into Indonesia eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So it took many years of patience to get to this point. Um, a lot of people changes. We have, uh, I've, I've matured a lot myself in terms mm -hmm. of how to manage and lead a company yeah. um, and recognize when you need to do some intentional redesign of organizations. Mm. Um, like for example, we redesigned our engineering team recently and it's worked out really well. Uh, so a lot of changes I can't, I, I don't think I can make really simplify into a yeah, yeah. simple answer, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I feel our mission has always been the same in terms of connecting diners and restaurants, but how we've gone about it, how it's evolved has changed. Mm -hmm. We started purely as a reservation platform. Mm -hmm. We started adding deals like the e-commerce segment to it. We started doing more in terms of like marketing. So I think the kind of opportunities has grown. I think the mission is still the same, but how we approach it is very different. Yep. I think in terms of like markets and what we've learned and uh, through that has also changed when we first went into our second market, which was Hong Kong, mm -hmm. we thought, okay, what's best about the Singapore model, sort of copy it and sort of paste it. I think it's evolved, the thinking has evolved a lot in terms of the localization of it all, in terms of being patient, like you said, we have also gone into markets like Indonesia. I think it was 2014 we went into Indonesia. Yeah. We're only seeing the results in these last two or three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we had pulled out way before, we would, might not ever have seen that. So I think like being patient about those things. I think the idea also of a little bit of the imposter syndrome, right? For me, I can only speak for myself because I was 22 and a little bit when I started. Mm -hmm. Everybody around me, I was very excited to learn from, but they all had these amazing degrees and all this pedigree that I didn't. And I think at the beginning, I was like, okay, I'm going to put my head down and work really hard. And that worked out for me. But yeah. then feeling like you belong and then making decisions and trusting your instinct and trusting your gut. Like you guys said, there's so, so many like well-meaning people or people who have achieved so much and you feel like, I got to take that advice. Oh, I got to do this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trying to marry all yeah. those things together to come to like, what's this one final conclusion? Yeah. So I think that the leaders I've seen of the organization and even my middle management, which is probably the single thing I'm most proud of to see how they've grown as individuals, how they've grown as people, mm -hmm. how they've like sort of taken charge. And even sometimes when they move away from Chope and go start their own companies or work in different businesses and see them thrive, I think that is like, there's a sense of pride for yeah. me because, you know, I know where they came from. I've seen how they've grown. So I think as a company, a lot of us have evolved as people. And I think it speaks to the way we conduct our business or the way we lead our teams now. Mm. Yeah. You didn't leave me much to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ignoring the business, how we have evolved as an organization. Yeah. We started off very scrappy, very hustler. Mm. We took pride in that. We realized that we had to professionalize. We went down the path of professionalizing professionalism of sorts, full goal structures, KPI cascades, a lot more structured. And now we're in the process of reversing that to some extent because mm. I think yeah. you look at scale and you want to grow and you think that the way to grow with scale is to professionalize and structure. Mm. Mm. Then after a while, you realize that shit, we're losing too much of this soul which kept us alive. Yeah. Then you start pulling back a bit and there's no right answer because I, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Mm. But I think it's a constant balance between pushing to professionalize and but yet keeping the soul of the organization alive. And I think that's just an ongoing mm. tug of war battle between the I, two I of them. I want to jump on that because you've all mentioned scale and you've all yeah. mentioned about growth, you know, between managing between one and 10, which is 10 to 100 people and even larger than that. Mm. So as you've scaled your businesses, what are some of the most sort of hard earned learnings that you've had to put into place to manage scaling in the right way? If you ask me, I think the thing which we do not regret doing, which is the most important, 
is putting in place a very clear job leveling and bending and salary system. Mm -hmm. Because every employee feels he's under, underpaid, every boss feels he's overpaying. So there's no right answer there in terms of what salaries. Mm -hmm. But having a very structured job bending system leaves a bit for interpretation perhaps, but that allows you to be a lot more objective on salaries, on where the organization goes. Right. Because you go from one to 10, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000. When you go from, at a point of 1,000, you, you won't know everyone. Mm -hmm. So there's no arbiter anymore on who's fairly paid. Yeah. From 1,000 to 10,000, you're way past that. Yep. And if you don't have these systems in place, the feeling of inequitability will creep in so strongly in organization. Yeah. You have nepotism, you have favoritism, you have all of these creeping in, mm -hmm. and eventually you might end up a very political organization. So if you ask me, I think that is probably one of the things which I thought was useful in that scaling up process, mm -hmm. which I wouldn't do without. I think for me, it was like codifying the values. I think when you start off with and everybody is sort of very aligned to the vision and the mission, and it's easy to like hire people that you know, like they believe in the same things or they have the same sort of ethic, a work ethic. And I think that like as you grow larger and larger, sometimes people like miss what makes the company special because they're not in on day one. They haven't mm -hmm. seen like both the benefits and the struggle, so they don't feel personally attached to it. And I think for us as an organization, the culture is so important. So by codifying some of the values, what do we believe in? What is like our utmost, like be, be, before anything else, what do we consider? Mm -hmm. I think that has helped to sort of like align people back into like when they look for people that they are hiring, you know, when they when people come into the organization and understand what's expected of them. I think that has helped a lot in terms of building the mindset. And then like what you said is true. There's so many of the like the nitty gritty <laughs> to think about all the structure around it to make it work well and to make it a fine like tuned machine. Mm -hmm. But for me, I feel that like if n people are not aligned in terms of like culture, vision, uh, it's it's hard to get to that point later because the expectations are different of, of how they operate or how people around them should operate yeah. because they come in from so many different organizations and some people come into a startup having worked in a corporate culture for a very very long time some people are serial like entrepreneurs or serial like startup uh, employees and yeah. so they come in with a very different sort of mindset and so sort of aligning that has been very very helpful in terms of the expectations for people coming. Just to add on to that something interesting the, the whole value system mm. I'm not saying I don't agree with it. Mm. <laughs> you cannot agree with it, by the way. It's okay. I got my values. It's there on yeah. the walls and everything. Yeah. But one of my mid-level employees said something which still resonates with me today. Mm. She said, you can put the values on the wall, but are you resolute and firm yeah. in dealing with senior management who may not represent mm. those values? Yeah. Mm. You have yeah. to enforce it. You have to 100%. enforce it. Yeah. But it's a lot harder than it sounds. Yeah. Because a bit, if they're lacking that a bit, you get a lot of culture dilution. Mm. And the moment the more junior employees see that, the senior guys are not embodying those values, yeah. mm. whatever's on the wall is just wallpaper. Yeah. It makes it worse, yeah. actually. It makes it worse. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important. Like, if you have that in place, you need to be so strict about this. Yeah. Like, you know, you talk about being decisive about things, and I think that's the one thing where when it comes to that, being decisive and knowing that, and sometimes it hurts, by the way, to let people go because okay. maybe they have a specific technical skill set, yeah. but like, it you know, the problems that it brings to the rest of the organization later, it's, it's not worth it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Easier said than done though, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. For me, I think the lesson learned, I would say is kind of a bit orthogonal, is that we're now about 600 people. We have maybe about 30,000 customers. Um, I find that individuals still matters. Right. It is still the individual that actually drives outcomes. Um, when we look at, whether to go into a new market or new business unit uh, to acquire a company is not strategy, it's not market, it's not um, synergies, it's not any of this kind of MBA paper you can do. It is, do we have the right guy? Mm. Yeah. That actually is what, in the end, when I look back, what, met, what made the difference on what worked and what didn't work. Mm. Right. Yeah, so that would be, I always underestimated that, I think, coming out because it's like, oh, it makes sense, so it should work. Yeah. But if you don't have the right person, it doesn't matter how much sense it makes. But the challenge there is, this is the right person, I completely agree with the right person, but in doing this job scope, then another guy who's also the right person for another job scope, they start fighting over who gets paid more. <laughs> yeah, so your, your bending is still important. It's still important, right? Still important. They start fighting over who's more valuable, then you go like, oh my god, you're both important, but please, <laughs> give me some, some objectivity to how you should yeah. be remunerated. So. So speaking of people, I wanted to ask because one thing I admire about your companies is you're all co-founders. Um, and a lot of companies get derailed because of issues between founders. 
So for your own experiences, how have you managed to maintain great relationships between your various co-founders and how do you separate, you know, who does what and how did you come to this sort of happy sort of marriage? First and foremost, I think it's important to know your co-founder. It's not about just sharing a passion for a certain industry or expertise. It is understanding why they are in this and what, what do they want out of it. I think that's key. Second is I run on three very clear rules which should diffuse all fights to a large degree. The first for me is, you know, if anyone's unhappy about something I did, for example, the first question I ask is, do you think I did it for selfish reasons personally? Mm. Two is, if you're unhappy for what I'm doing to you or what uh, uh, something I, I decided on, the question then is, am I being unfair to you in a negative way? And the third is, do you actually believe that I think this is good for the company? I think once you can agree to all three, then it is in a very uncertain, who's to say who's right and who's wrong. But then it becomes a, a discussion. It is not a blame game. But the moment you let it devolve into a blame game where you start casting suspicion that you're doing it for selfish reasons or that you're pushing me out or that you, you have another agenda altogether, then I think this creates a lot of tensions between co-founders. So I follow these three rules and I think most times we resolve everything amicably. I mean, you can't walk away happy all the time, but at least there's no significant displeasure uh, between co-founders. I, I feel for me specifically, it's, it's about like balance and having someone almost like you're very aligned on what the goal is, but you're very different people individually. And I think it's about dividing and conquering. We each have our own space. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I focus on the people. Uh, and a little bit on the on the growing the day-to-day -day business. So a lot of those, like the people decisions come down to me, Ooh. where with my uh, founder or, or co-founder in this case, Arif, like he's very focused on strategy. He's very focused on like elements of which markets we should go in, the growth side of things. So I think that we both, is, is very important decisions for both of us to make together. And I think that even when we disagree and we disagree on a lot of things at different times, <laughs> we always say when we walk out of the room, we, we share a united message. And I think that's important as well, because like you can can have those disagreements and sometimes you can be upset about certain things you're like you should have listened to me about this we've all had the i told you so moments <laughs> in the 13 years we've done business yeah. together told you so told you so you know but at the end of the day i think presenting that united front is one but i think it was very helpful that we have different level uh, like expertise and different areas that we can own so you don't feel like someone is maybe encroaching on that area a little bit mm -hmm. and i think then it just makes for something that's a little bit more harmonious at the end of the day yeah yeah for me i think first point i share with Changwen a lot which is that the having the trust on the intent mm. if you trust the person's intention is good then a lot of things can be solved on a logical level and you can also agree to disagree and kind of uh, disagree and commit and compromise. Um, not all marriages are all agreeable and happy all the time, right? Which is fine. Because if you treat it as a relationship that you're supposed to work on with a common objective, uh, as long as you trust the intent, I think a lot can be solved. Mm. Um, and sometimes uh, this punishes my outlive. Uh, outlive is, is duration, mm. and that's okay. And um, you know, my one of my co-founders was who was my co college roommate. Mm -hmm. He has left the company and he was still best friends and he's going to be my best friend. So Darius, early on we talked, we talked over lunch and um, you did ask Dinesh this question. What is the best decision he's ever made? But we didn't get to ask you the question back. Like, what is the best decision you've ever made throughout these past, what, 20 years of running your businesses? Uh, I would say it's amongst many bad decisions. <laughs> Right, like so, I can look at all the this bad decisions. I can pick out. Oh, yeah, this one was actually pretty good. Yeah. And it almost always have to stick. Have to do with kind of sticking to your gut mm -hmm. and defying what logic sometimes mm -hmm. is. Um, whether it is picking a person. So I think some of the best decision I've made is picking a person, despite what the CV says, despite what mm -hmm. the interview round says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can, you can just see that that person has fire. They have. They have something with them. Mm. Um, I say that picking people probably the best decisions I made, yeah. amongst many bad ones. Yeah, I well, I, I feel like the people decision for me is like I can resonate with that a lot. Mm -hmm. It's hard to think back for thirteen years specifically. Yeah. So when he asked me to narrow it down to the last year, yeah. it was very bittersweet. But the truth is, I think the idea of getting acquired was like the best decision we made. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and as much as you lose some as, some autonomy uh, from that, as much as culture changes, as much as those things happen, and it, it's maybe no longer your baby in the same way that it was before, mm. I think you have to see like where's the business growing. Are you the best person to take it to that next level? You look at the market around. You look at consolidation. You look at the ability for people to raise money versus you. Right? We have outlived so many companies who are much better funded than us, trying to play in the same space, yep. which is great. But at some point someone is going to be able to wear you down. <laughs> yeah. And does it make sense to keep uh, in the way we are with a, in a smaller startup, in a smaller environment, when you have people in the US or in other parts of Asia raising like 10, 20x what you are able to do yep. because of the market size? So I think we really thought about it. We took ourselves out of the equation. It's not about like our own ambitions or us as leaders anymore, mm -hmm. or like what is great for like our personal sort of gain. And we talked about, okay, what is great for this company and how can we maintain the value that we've worked so tirelessly yeah. <laughs> to create for the last 13 years. And that was the outcome and it was bittersweet. And I think when we finally, when all of that closed and it was announced, it was like great. And at the same time, there was a bit of mourning on that because you have so many memories yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that was probably, yeah, in, in recent time, that was probably the best decision that uh, I've made. I must admit, I was trying to think of one while you we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> and truth be told, I think I failed to come up with a very resolute good one. Yeah. Somehow or another, it feels like bad decisions stay with you. You remember that? Mm. Good decisions come and go. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like in this job, you are meant to make good decisions. So you don't really weigh what's good, what's not good. And I think many times, good decisions also come quite logically to a large extent. It is the difficult dilemmas where you would then have to choose between them where you then say, oh, that's a good decision. But truth be told, as you said just now, you, you never know what's actually the right way. Because mm -hmm. you did choose one path over the other. Yeah. Who's to say that the other path would have been wrong? I think it's a lot easier for me to say I've made a wrong decision because I've see it. i seen it blow up yeah. as opposed to this is the right decision because I knew that I had another choice then and then, but I did not take it. So I'm not sure if I could say that that necessarily was the best choice. But if I had to choose one, I will just say it's... Um, Job bending. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it all comes down to. If there's one thing you take away from this conversation, it's job bending. It's I mean, you helpful. ask me strategy, finance, yeah. everything. You can logically go through many different things and you can come to an agreement of sorts. One thing you cannot agree to disagree on is someone's salary. It's the best decision then for you to stay in this business and keep investing your time growing this, growing this business. Yeah, no, that, that I think is quite clear to me. It's, it's not yeah. a good decision. I think it's a natural decision. What is, as I always say, the hardest thing to do not is... Not always natural to some. <laughs> no, but I think that's being, about very, being very self-aware. Mm. Like, you know, yeah. if I know that at this level of the company, I look around and I see others who are able to perform at much higher levels, yeah. then I think maybe I should step away yeah. because I would rather my shares be worth money than for me to be in a position which is worthless. Mm. So I think that, that I think I have no problem being quite self-aware on what to give up, what not to give up. So I think at the moment it's still okay, but well, let's see. Let's see. We'll check back in in five we'll Check back in yeah. five days. But that's one of the hardest things I think. We've seen a lot, I've seen a lot of founders who have clung to that CEO role versus stepping back and maybe taking a chairman role. Um, because they, they've resolutely believed they can do it better than say a professional sort of that they bring in or, so, or someone else in the company. And that can be very dangerous. Mm. Well, I think the best way to hold a mirror to yourself all the time, I think the first thing you do professionalize and surround yourself with professionals of sorts, co-founders and professionals. Second, tell your board that you are always open to their opinion on that. And when the board, okay, look, it's one thing to tell the board that, and surround yourself with all of your good friends. Mm. Because you know the board will never dare to kick you out because you will pull the entire organization out. It is one thing to not tell the board that but professionalize because the professionals may not tell you that either. But once you do that on above you and below you, I think you, you lend yourself the, the space in which people can be very honest with you. Mm. And it's up to you if you want to take your honest feedback or not. Yeah. But at least you create a space where your board that's there to tell you that you could do better mm. and the professionals are there to not make the board fear that it's all or nothing. Mm. So my thoughts on that, yeah. I mean, I don't agree with founders who cling on, like you said, if mm. they're not the best person for the job, but I understand it mm -hmm. because be they will not feel like anybody would love this company as much as they do. Yeah. Or may and they can have the best intention to want to grow this company or feel that they're be the best person. Mm -hmm. And that's where the self-awareness comes in, right? Because I think some people maybe aren't as self-aware that they're the best person for the job. Uh, and so they continue doing it because they truly feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it may not 
always end up in a in the best outcome. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. I, I completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> we like this, uh, don't and you? I, and yeah. and this may be very convenient for me to say, but I actually think the founders are often the best person for the job, mm. Mm. Um, more often than not. Mm. Um, and I mean, I'm also a bit of an angel investor. So I've invested in maybe about thirty companies over ten years period. Um, I found that the whole idea, unless the founder is burnt out, not motivated don't really want to do it um, and or, or it really screwing up big time and need to be forced to change. Uh, more often than not, the founder is always the best person for the job, as far as I can see. Man, I don't disagree with you like, at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> at the moment, I'm yeah. just giving I mean, the, the right I, thing I for us like... to say yeah. <laughs> is that maybe somebody is better for the job, so we will, we'll be happy to give up. No, no. Say only ma. I, I, I believe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you mentioned founder burnout. And yeah. one of the topics that has, comes up a lot, especially in our Gen T conversations yeah. at Tyler, is mental wellness and mental health for founders. And that's, yeah. that's something that... <laughs> Taiwan! <laughs> Do you like to discuss Are you this okay? topic? <laughs> no one has asked Strawberry him Strawberry yeah. term. Yeah. What on it earth is... Like it. Yeah. Mental go, go, wellness go, 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 go. <laughs> fallacy. Balance is important in this world. Mm. So, well... Wellness is important to a certain extent. Is this the PR answer? <laughs> and, and give us the real juice. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think there are times when it gets really tough, right? There's no space and time for mental wellness. Mental wellness is what you find in yourself. It's the grit and the determination. And you just have to learn to dampen your, am your amplitudes of emotions. You have to learn to be very objective. You have to learn to be merciless, emotionless. If you ask me, you have to get there. If you get too easily affected, then I think you make a lot of wrong decisions. That said, I think mental wellness helps you deal with the extremities of your emotions. But your own ability to control your extremities, that is, in my opinion, a lot on what you need to work on yourself. So I'm not saying that mental wellness is wrong. You still need that. <laughs> but if you cannot control your emotions, you will spend 80% of your life in a mental wellness room. But that should not be the case because you should be working. If you need to control your emotions first, then maybe some mental wellness can help you on the off, in, in the rare case that you lose it. My thoughts. Definitely not. Clearly, Chang doesn't thoughts. want to be cancelled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I'm with him. I, I, I think there is a difference between trying to build infrastructure to help you stay well. Mm. And like for me, my wife is a big part of it, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that's the person I talk to at night about our problems. And that helps a lot. Um, but it's a very different thing to say that, well, you know, I'm burned out, mental wellness is important, take time off and so on, right? Like I, I think... Back in the days, I don't think that was an option at all, right? I think when we first started, we were never told when yeah. mental mental wellness is a option <laughs> to consider or is a is a is a factor to be considered. It's like you're in it, you're in it. Because I think take, you die. taking time off doesn't necessarily solve the problems that you're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. So I think like having a support system, I mean, that is a form of mental wellness, right? So yeah. making sure that there are people you can talk to who can relate to what you do. So it, it, it's divorced from the idea of like, oh, I should work less or I should do this less. Yeah. But I think it's more about the idea of like, okay, who can I speak to? Or are there opportunities or, or tools around me to help me overcome this as opposed to try to divorce those two things from each other? Yeah, coaches and so on. Like, yeah. I, I agree with all, the, all of those things. Yeah. Um, but it's a very different thing to say that wellness is something that you need to build into part of um, the agenda. I don't think that's saying, saying that right. Maybe I'll get cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> but would you agree that the founder's journey is sometimes lonely? Or is it something because you guys have co founders, you have the support systems built in? Yeah. Regardless, I think it's lonely. It is lonely. It's meant to be. It's part of the fun. <laughs> part of fun. the fun. I think it's important to have, like, like I said, co-founders help because they sort of understand and they are also making decisions on that level. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I, I, I'm very fortunate, like the teams below me are very supportive, but they will also never fully understand the extent of what you're going through. It's almost like 
you know, like maybe a parent and a child, where the child sees the trouble that's happening, but they don't understand sometimes the how difficult it is to be sitting in that room making those decisions. I don't think that, you know, like when decisions are made right, people celebrate you, and and when they don't, and then you know other things happen. And I think that the pressure of being in that situation, whether you make the right move or the wrong move, like even just being there. Having that weight on your shoulders, I think it's it's something that sometimes people won't fully relate to, even if they want to, right? Even if they want to be there for you, I think it's it's hard for them to relate because they're not in that same position as you are. Yeah. How do you though deal with your own? I mean, I, I I'm, I'm I'm fortunate. Like I said, like you know, I have a founder who's who's amazing, and I can yeah. speak to him about anything, and then that helps. Uh, and I think then, you know, in, in different in different circumstances, you just have to know that okay, if this is if. No one else can relate to you in this moment, and then you just have to be like, okay. But if you think about it, if you truly believe in the decisions that you're making, and then you just have to be sort of okay with that. Um, for me, faith is important to me, so that's something that I turn to as well. It helps keep me balanced. Uh, so yeah. Let's move the conversation a little to the the big picture. I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> to the big picture of tech in general. Um, what brought macro trends? Have you, each of you, seen in the tech landscape, perhaps in the last five years, and how is it impacting your businesses? The buzzword is AI, I <laughs> guess. Right? Right. That's what everybody <laughs> talks about. You know, I think the idea of of, of that is is exciting, mm -hmm. a little bit scary. I think yeah. the pace in which like you're meant to think of adopting it, and if you don't, you're left behind. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, uh, a little bit of a gray area for me. I think all these things are essentially are meant to help move things along faster, be more efficient, as opposed to necessarily replacing people. I think that's like the big conversation of, will it replace this? Will it replace that? And I think that in a business like like ours, where we're dealing in, in dining and yeah. the service industry, and you think about things like robots and self-serve and all of that, mm. I think, yes, to some extent, it can help move things along faster, but you lose that, that touch, right? That human touch. Yeah. You, you, you go out, out to have like a social occasion. You want to be in that sort of environment. You want to be sort of have that bad service can ruin a great meal mm. and good service can make you want to come back again and again and again mm. and i think that the idea of like you know robots are doing all this yeah well intentioned but you know is the outcome the desired outcome the same so the same for our business in terms of thinking about using ai to sort of replace people or like writers content you guys are in, in that space mm -hmm. right the idea that tomorrow you can teach someone to do something or teach a machine and yes i'm sure there are a lot of great things they can do mm -hmm. but then you still need to have someone who's looking over all of that and making yeah. sure it's in the right it's in the right uh, a direction of what you want to do. So I think the idea of a lot of these trends and some of them come and go, I think AI is one that's going to stay for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think because it is useful, it is important, it has a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. I think we have to look at those things and, and say, first of all, don't latch onto it just because you feel everybody else is latching onto it. I think that's important. Yep. But I think it's, it's thinking about it in the context of your business and to see which parts do you feel it's necessary for and can help move things along better yeah. and, and make life better for you and, and which parts you're just like okay you know what I think as much as people are banking on it now and we've seen many trends come and go uh, maybe it's not the right move for my business so I think sometimes you have to be like brave enough to say that uh, and, and to to see how how it, if it works the business, if it works yeah. Yeah. yeah macro right yeah he spoke about the macro yes in general I think most people are thinking that way no, not with so much enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I think in a lot of other businesses, I think what's important is a pragmatism towards tech. Mm. I think that is also coming up. There is that enthusiasm on AI and what that could hold. Yeah. But I think the flip side is a lot more companies are becoming a lot more pragmatic on technology. Mm. That technology is not the be all and all. A poorly run business will not get saved by tech. Mm. A business with shit customer service will not do better if the website is fancy. Yeah. So I think people have become a lot more pragmatic on how much value tech can add mm -hmm. and dialing back to the right amount of tech and the right amount of focus towards the people, towards the customer experience, yeah. more than just the technology per se. Mm -hmm. And I think we are one of them where we understand that technology is important at different aspects. Yeah. But in some of our initiatives, the people, the strategy, the right person is way more important than any technology you can throw. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is the other macro trend we're seeing. Yeah. The reality is the majority of businesses or tech businesses in Southeast Asia are still tech enabled. Mm -hmm. It is not pure tech. We are not like Jira or building real tech tools. It's 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 a bit different. Mm -hmm. 
So I think we need to temper ourselves and not get too caught up with what we see happening in Silicon Valley mm. and taking all that and just replicating it here. Mm. Because then you build very bad habits per se, I, I believe. And different markets, right? Like, I mean, you're in Indonesia as well. I mean, like some people try to adopt tech in a big way yeah. and then they realize actually because there's so much labor and opportunity there, actually that is the best course and it actually works better than some of the tech enablement that they do. Yeah. So, you know, it's really what works best for that market, for that for, for that company, mm. as opposed to just thinking, oh, okay, everybody should adopt this. Okay, great, let's move forward with that. Yeah. 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 For me, I really like the last two years actually because I think um, tech was sexy for a while and then tech was not sexy and then that's the macro mm -hmm. but not sexy is great mm -hmm. um, and I think like what Chang was saying right uh, what, what people are not paying attention to is the very large established businesses they're slowly moving in terms of the adoption of tech and how yeah. that's changing and how that actually make how the real progress is actually made with those things and not the se sexy noisy things mm -hmm. neither is it so pessimistic and it's completely unsexy now mm -hmm. Um, the real progress is ma made by this step-by-step -step movement forward. Um, I give, now that you're part of Grab, one of your competitors in Indonesia, for example, Bluebird, right? I was just with um, uh, one of the senior people there and they were doing amazing things in terms of that really the back-end depot, how they do you know, inventory for their repair parts and so on and making that efficient, right? And that's something that is, and, and this is why Bluebird in Indonesia is still more reliable than Grab. That's a car. That's a vehicle, uh, right? Like you can talk about the you can talk about man. right and like, <laughs> all you want. But Bluebird is reliable. Right? So good to know. Those basic <laughs> things continue to, mm. to move forward in yeah. a very unsexy, nobody paying attention it's to true. It. That's the macro thing that I'm I'm very interested in. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you ask me the last 10 years, the model of dangling sexy tech and humongous incentives came together to distort the perception of the value tech can bring. Mm. And I think that is something which a lot of founders are paying for. We've seen lofty valuations, raise tons of money, yeah. killed each other fighting the market. Yeah. Nobody won. The only yeah. people who have won are the consumers. consumers yeah. Yeah. But VCs lost, private equity lost, investors lost, founders lost, yeah. employees lost, everyone lost. Yeah. Because everyone was overly enamored with the idea of tech. And I think that is changing. Yeah. And I think we're very supportive of rationalizing and being a lot more pragmatic on, on so this. What, so what is the funding landscape today like vis-a-vis -vis when you guys were first starting out? AI businesses? only now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know it's easier to raise money with a PowerPoint presentation than it is to raise money on the company that's actually working and successful? Oh. Just because like the idea that like, okay, I can only maybe make 2x my money because we see how the business is like. It's supposed mm -hmm. to, this is brand new. You've never tested it, but you know, I could make 15x, you know? So it, it, it's a strange, I think people are a little bit more like maybe pragmatic now, especially like before where, where it's all about profitability now, a little bit more than just pure growth. Yeah. But there's still a lot of that around, mm -hmm. I think that I hear. And uh, I, I have friends who try to pitch companies that are perfectly great companies and working really well and they're just looking for a little bit of an infusion yeah. and they're like, nah, you know, <laughs> we want to bet on things that are maybe 10, 15, <laughs> 20x still. Mm. Uh, it surprises me a little bit. I think there's all, I I'm, always have an appetite for a good idea, yeah. but sometimes, you know, maybe it's, it's the balance of the risk versus to say like, hey, this is, this is really working. People really love it. Mm. Why should it be so difficult to raise money on that? Yeah. yeah. I'm a little bit older, so I've seen kind of the cycle mm -hmm. from like when I first started my first company in 03 there were no VCs like zero funding available and then fast forward 10 years there's way too much money available mm -hmm. like what Chang was saying now this I think is very under invested and mm -hmm. for those investments that are still actually happening is still, is still, still going for kind of the, the sexy 10x 15x thing like mm -hmm. you're saying right um, and not really paying attention to what would not, I think people like, always like to ask the question, and this is a question I think, I believe Jeff Bezos asked. People like, like to ask the question, what would change tomorrow? Mm. I think the question to ask is, what would not change tomorrow? Mm. That's actually a more important question. There's a lot of things that will not change. People yeah. always, in the e-commerce space, people always want things cheaper, faster, and more variety. Mm -hmm. That's never going to change. Yeah. Like, what companies that's going to win in that environment, I think that is really worth thinking about. Yeah, too many people are looking at AI, what would change, taking bets mm. on that, but humans are the same. We'll, we'll say the same 10 years later. Darius, you mentioned you are uh, a seed investor, angel investor in a lot of startups. 
Um, I wanted to know whether you guys also are also investing in small startups and what do you look for when you are identifying a, a business or a founder to invest in yourselves? I, I was an agent investor back in the days. I don't do it anymore um, because I sold my first company and worked for a large corporations. Um, hence, Ichi wanted to live vicariously the exciting life through other founders. Um, but I think I didn't have this methodology. But today, if you ask me what I would do, I would do two rather unconventional things. One is I would look at where are they at? What are they doing on a Friday night, 11 p.m.? Mm. Right? It's not strategy. It's not market. It's not product. It's nothing. It's what are you doing Friday night, 11 p.m.? That's actually what matters. And number two, what is your social media feed or LinkedIn feed consists of? Mm. Like that, those two signals are to me the most important. But rem remember for me, it's usually the first check, pre-products, pre-revenue, you know, first 25,000, 50,000 type of. Um, type of investment. So people and what are they made of is really matter matters the most. So just so we are clear, Friday <laughs> night working, not partying. It's Social like, media yeah. more subtle, not loud, <laughs> ready, right? Just making sure that because you, you, you said that's what you got for, but depends on the business. Depends on the business. <laughs> yeah, if you are a KOL marketing bad. platform, maybe you should be partying, it should be loud and Mm. And and how your ability yeah. to blend so those. So you use that to assess character, then from there you see if that character fits that business model. Yeah, yeah. But by and large, I would say that <laughs> it's yes, more working and not partying <laughs> is probably the, <laughs> the one I'm looking for. Yeah. Not, not in bed asleep at 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> mental wellness, I tell you. <laughs> you know, sleep's important. I can yeah. tell you. <laughs> mental wellness, 6 p.m. Don't call me. Okay, bye bye. Okay, Friday, 11 p.m. If they're working and you know they're younger, sure. If they're like in their 50s, you know. Go to bed. Mm. Go to bed. You need to recharge. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Good for you. Just don't take my money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, harsh. I, look, people at the end of the day are the cornerstone of any business. And I think when he's talked about like founders, most of the time being the best person to run the company, mm. then it's important to look at the founders. Yeah. I agree with that. I haven't had uh, the privilege of, of, of investing myself in terms of financially, mm -hmm. but time-wise, definitely. I think the one thing I look for also in the people is that they are pragmatic. They don't have delusions of grandeur, you know? Sometimes <laughs> mm. people look at stuff and they're like, we want to raise this money or we want this valuation. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, what are you going to do with the money? And they're like, hmm, you know? <laughs> they're like, you know, they can't answer you. So I think being like pragmatic about what you're trying to do and, and being very clear about the problem you're trying to solve. Mm. I think sometimes people go into uh, building companies or starting companies because it's cool or because they see other people do that. Yeah. But maybe it's not necessarily for them. And that's fine too. Uh, and so I think like understanding the intention behind it, mm -hmm. understanding the problem they are trying to solve, understanding like, you know, what makes them tick. Like really it's about the person. I think that that part is there. And then making sure that the right sort of support system of people around them to enable them to continue. Mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Well, to be frank, I, I haven't done many angel investments. Uh, the few I done I I've known them for a long time so I think there's enough trust out there mm. yeah. that you know business is a lot of luck but if there's certain character traits which could make you a bit luckier than others then sure I think it's uh it's worth a bet mm. and I think I agree with what you said only to repeat that but sometimes I also worry that I'm putting a mirror to myself and I want to do invest in people who are more like me than not mm. but I think there are many other character traits which could be successful so I am also a bit uneasy at times because I don't think it's necessarily true that I should invest or people who are like me will be successful. I think there are many other types, archetypes out there. Oh. So because of that, usually no conviction to do anything. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to thank you guys for spending your time with us. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. We're going to end in a few minutes, but before we do, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time, I just want to ask you if you have any uh, parting words for a young founder um, who will be coming to you and saying, you know, is there any advice? Is there one thing you can tell me as I start my journey? Uh, he's hoping we start talking. So yeah, <laughs> it looks like you can't say something. If you ask me, I'll just stick to what I say. If you're a young person coming to me for advice mm -hmm. on whether you should leave your job and start mm -hmm. a new business, my first piece of advice is, is this opportunity going to go away? Mm -hmm. And are you certain it is really so unique? There are a few businesses out there which are that unique. Yeah. The second would be if the answers to the first questions are uh, that it's okay, you have time, I would say take another five years. Don't work for money, work for experience. Work under people whom you can learn a lot from. And you have another 
30 years after that they were in business. So don't rush it. Yeah, I largely agree with that. I think if you have to be very passionate about the problem you're trying to solve. Mm. I think a lot of times people look for problems to solve mm. without feeling that it's something that they really want to. Mm. Because if you have that level of conviction, then you're going to have for the most part, what it takes to try to focus on that. And then I think it's about surrounding yourself with the right people. Like I said, when I started, I was young. Yep. If I did this alone, I don't think I would have been able to do it in that way. I had people who had great job experience, had gone to different schools. And so uh, all of that came together very, very nicely. Yep. So I think if you're going to start it, then you also have to pick the right people that you're going to start it with. Um, I think it's it's sometimes hard to do it like on your own unless you feel you have the resources or the know-how. Mm -hmm. I think that is quite rare. Uh, so I think it's important to pick the right people around you. So I think that two things, uh, understanding the problem you're trying to solve, feeling convicted about that, and then mm -hmm. picking the right team or the right people to kick that, kickstart that journey with. Yeah. My advice will be, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Serious. I think the people... It's now become so sexy to start something. Mm. The bar is too low. Mm. If somebody, you know, listened to my advice and still decided to do it, maybe that's, maybe he should do it. But by and large, don't do it. Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. So much. Thank you guys. So Thank much. you so much. Thank you.